Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney broadcasting from the Valley of the Sun, deep in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. And today we're talking about the feds being everywhere because they are. Over 50 of them allegedly being reported by the defense team in Proud Boys trial day 53. We're going to go through all of it. You remember our friend Ray Epps who has become the symbol of federal informant activity. And so he is not in the subject of this show today. As far as we know, there was a subpoena floating around to try to get him in to testify. Of course, we're going to go into the full trial day, day 53. Zachary Real, who is a Proud Boy defendant, he did testify. And so there's going to be a lot of good stuff to unpack there as we get the trial courtesy of Brandy Buckman on Twitter. Always recommend you follow her at Brandy underscore Buckman on Twitter. Now, there's going to be more. We've got several Whopper filings that I really want to spend a little bit of time on today. They're quite good. First one is coming from Dominic Pozzola, the defense. This is where the big headline comes in, right? Over 50 informants. And you know, last time we were here, the last motion, it was over 40 informants. And the list keeps growing and growing and growing. And if you've been with us here for some time, you may remember when it was eight informants. Remember that? <laughs> and it turned into 50. <laughs> what a stupid joke. All right. So we're going to go through this now. 50 informants. Remember, there are only five defendants here, which means the ratio is not good. So we'll go through that. We've got an expert witness is being brought in to talk about the defense objections to damage assessments remember they're saying that every single one of these people almost took over america each one of them simultaneously together and individually took over the country and so they're all kind of cumulatively responsible for the damage but they're all also uniquely individually responsible for the damage and so we're asking ourselves if you know there's a thousand so-called insurrectionists who broke all the windows who's really responsible for the actual monetary value how do you divvy this up if there's two two and a half million dollars of damage, how do you apportion it to everybody? And if you apportion two and a half million dollars and you you can't, you, know, you have to ascribe it. You can't just sort of throw receipts at people. So the defense is bringing in a window expert. They're gonna try to get this in. And so I wanted to spend a minute on this because it is funny, you know I mean? They're kind of small damages we're also talking about here when you break it down individually. They turn it into the crime of the century, actually the crime of a couple centuries, and they are, a little bit nuts. So we'll go through all of that. Then there's another great filing from our friend Carmen Hernandez on behalf of Zachary Real. She filed two different motions, one for a mistrial. She's saying there is no independent evidence that supports Zachary Real being convicted of conspiracy or anything, really. You know, he has been the one that we didn't see any evidence of violence activity in Carmen Hernandez. Her defense has often been did you see him hit anybody or throw anything or punch anybody did you even see him you know and he's been sort of the one most removed from this entire ordeal and so she says if you want to include him in a conspiracy you got to have some independent evidence to make the connection so we'll go through that one and then there was the big court of appeals ruling that we went through last week i believe yes last week and it dismissed well there was a conversation about the obstruction charge, and we spent a lot of time on the majority opinion and on the dissent, but really there was some good stuff in the concurring opinion that we just glossed right over. And they are latching onto this. They're saying that there's a little bit of gray area there, and this justifies a dismissal of the obstruction charge because they can't prove the corruptly portion of this. And we, of course, did talk about the corruptly portion of this in the majority opinion, but the defense is saying there's still some ambiguity there that justifies a dismissal of the obstruction charge. So last week we were we were speculating that those charges were going to be coming back, but the defense is actually continuing forward with their attempts to have them dismissed. So very good stuff. And we want to see what their arguments are and go through it. And so we'll get back to day 53, courtesy of Brandy Buckman, but as you can tell on our mind map here, and our mind map, you know, you can use this software if you want to build some things on your own. I use it for a lot of my notes. I use it for a lot of life planning and stuff like that. You can grab the link at spotlightlawyer.com, mind map, sign up for a free account. You can also go to spotlightlawyer.com slash Trump 
and get the Trump mind map for the Trump prosecution if you want to check that out. But we also want to say before we get into all of this, we got some motions, we got some heavy lifting. And so be sure to check out our friends over at Field of Greens, where we would all like to go to lose some of those leftover pandemic holiday pounds. You know, it's a new year. We've got summer right around the corner. It's heating up here. And so we got to remember to eat our greens. We're all sick of all the fad loss, fad weight loss diets and all that thing. You know, we, we've all been there. We've all done that. And we know they don't work. But you know what does? Eating five healthy servings of fruits and vegetables every day. You do that, the weight would probably just fall right off. But vegetables, not a fan. And fruit, who's got time to prepare that every day? So let's talk about Field of Greens. You see it right here on your screen. It's a very specific formula of fruits and vegetables that you won't find in any other product. We know that proper nutrition reboots your metabolism, so you burn calories faster and you lose weight a healthier way. And Field of Greens is the only brand backed by a better health promise. Yes, you're going to look healthier and feel healthier fast, but the greater proof is going to come at your next checkup when your doctor says, wow, you've lost weight. Whatever you're doing, keep it up. And so let's get you started. Go on over to fieldofgreens.com. When you check out, add in Field of Greens into your cart. I've got mine right here. My mama has hers. I tell my mom, eat your greens, mama. And she says, all right, son. So get yours at 15% off at checkout. Use code Robert. Remember, the vegetables want to be eaten. They pop out of the ground bursting with energy so that you'll eat them and make their dreams come true. You'll be bursting with green energy. Check them out. Fieldofgreens.com. Code Robert. All right. And also after the program, we're going over for our debrief, watching the watchers.locals.com. Thank you to our YouTube members and our locals members. We're hanging out after the show. So don't go anywhere. All right. And so let's get right into it on the day because we got some serious business to attend to. Dominic Pozzola, Proud Boy defendant, files a motion to dismiss, saying that there are 50 plus informants that were amongst the Proud Boys on January 6th which begs the question, if this was a massive seditious conspiracy and this was on the verge of taking over the country, what were those 50 informants doing? What were the federal agents doing who were monitoring and handling those informants and how they let it get so far? Interesting. We're going to go through the motion. There's also a conversation about a window expert because Pozzola, like many other J6 defendants, is being blamed for the entire downfall of America individually. And the, the defense is saying, not so fast. You have to prove those damages. You can't blame him for all $80 million that don't exist of damages. So we're going to have to be articulate on what those damages are. So let's start with this motion. Over 50 informants in a motion to dismiss. Filed by Dominic Pizzola's defense team. They write in an 11-page filing, this is Pizzola's motion for a mistrial and a new trial for multiple Brady violations. Now, they say that the defendants, the Proud Boys, are now aware of at least some 50 undercover informants among protesters on January 6th. But the government is withholding information regarding this exculpatory evidence. The government has the evidence. They know who they are. They know what they were doing. They know who they were working with. The defense says, wait a minute, you're blaming us and our clients for being a part of a massive conspiracy. It sounds like they were a subset of a bigger conspiracy. The federal government had tabs on everything that was going on. And so we may have questions about some of the evidence that the defense sent to these CHSs or these informants because it might prove to exonerate them. But if we don't know who those sources are, then we can't demand and go investigate those texts or those messages in the Telegram groups to exonerate our clients. So they say that now the defense and Dominic Pozzola is now asking the court to order a mistrial. And a new trial due to numerous and repeated yet unfolding Brady violations involving CHSs. They say, Judge, Your Honor, the court is already aware that the prosecution in this case has been slow to disclose and turn over exculpatory evidence regarding the scale, the scope, and the nature of the sources within and around the Proud Boys leading up to the events of J6. The FBI had CHSs positioned at the very highest levels of the Proud Boys, including several who were the actual presidents 
of the Proud Boys chapters. <laughs> the feds had informants who were running entire groups. It's just unbelievable. And then they call them a terroristic organization that is trying to take over the country. It's mostly feds. <laughs> now, there were also FBI CHSs within the Ministry of Self-Defense. This is the very chat group that the government claims was the vehicle where they were all conspiring. And this was the mechanism for the mythical plout, Proud Boy plot to overthrow the government. If there had been any actual conspiracy within this chat to violently thwart the transfer of presidency, these informants would have been in a position to alert and inform the authorities of the plot. Why didn't they do this? But now with the trial almost over, it were in day 53 now, and opportunities to examine most government witnesses are all but non-existent. The defense has recently learned, shockingly, that the FBI informants were vastly outnumbered by informants. The defense has learned that FBI informants and CHSs were vastly outnumbered by informants, CHSs, and plain clothes operators representing other law enforcement agencies. A new agency enters the game. They're called Homeland Security Investigations. They played a major role in this. Many handlers, many of them were running CHSs amongst the Proud Boys. Now, there is information here. The defense calls it plainly exculpatory. Body cam videos worn on J6 by undercover Metro PD officers show the undercover officers cheering on demonstrators. The cops are out there in the crowd. They're chanting, go, go, go. They're chanting, stop the thing. They're chanting, whose house? Our house. And the defendants, they say, have a pro se J6 defendant in another case, William Pope, to thank for these revelations. And so shout out to William Pope. It was Pope who apparently found the body camera videos buried amidst the discovery dumps and filed a motion alerting the world. Shout out to William Pope. These videos are published. Now we see undercover operatives who were planted among the protesters as instigators, they say, not just observers. And just this past weekend, over Easter, the defense learned that there were at least 10 to 12 additional previously unknown plainclothes MPD officers among the Proud Boys. This brings the total number of informants among defendants on or around J6 to 50 or more. 50 or more. Just by the defense count. It's probably many times more than that. This is what they've been able to identify. These are not confirmed by the government. The government confirmed that there was a list. There was, there's different batches of these, but they're assembling these numbers throughout this trial. This number has not been reported to the jurors also, mind you. The government has only stipulated that there were, I think, eight CHSs that the jury will hear about. They're not going to hear about 50 additional informants unless this judge changes course. And there are reasons to suspect the true number is higher. I have no doubt about that. It's probably many multiples of that. We have Metro PD. We have Homeland Security. We have FBI. I'm sure there are many more within those agencies, and there are probably other agencies. The government's response to these late disclosures is to present three Metro PD officers to the defense for interviews. Federal, prosecutor, federal prosecutors selected the three. They picked them. On Friday, April 7th, Metro PD officer Thomas Sula was presented to the defense for an interview. He had a lawyer by his side. 
And when counsel asked why Thomas Sula's name was not found in the list of 12 undercover MPD electronic surveillance unit officers on January 6th, it was already provided to the defense. Hey, why is your name not in here? Thomas Sula, the prosecutors picked you. Why are you here? Why is your name not in my list? He said, uh, what is this list? And he said, well, they're looking at the list. And your electronic surveillance unit? Yeah, well, he's looking at it. He replied, uh, well, I was not assigned in the same way. And I was not a member of the electronic surveillance unit. And the, the defense, they're sitting there. They're going, well, that's weird. We thought you were somebody who was from this unit. And the government picked you? They say, note that the Metro PD document that was previously provided to the defense in discovery indicated the 12 undercover officers were the total manpower. That's it, right? So when the government, they have all of the cards in this game. They're supposed to play fair. They're supposed to provide the exculpatory evidence so that the defense can make their case. Otherwise, the defense doesn't have anything. It would be like if you got pulled over and stopped for a DUI and they drew your blood and they said, wow, you're look, look at all these drugs in your system. I don't have any drugs in my system. He said, can I see the results? No, he can't show you it. Why not? Sources and methods. What are you, nuts? I can't show you what's in there. Then, we'll, then you'll know how we analyze and test the blood. Sources and methods. Also, we're an FBI agency, don't you know? This is national security and your DUI was the worst thing that's happened since the Civil War. It's nuts. And when they provide these little bit of uh, drabs of information over to the defense, one of these main claims in this entire case is there's this conspiracy that they're involved in. If there is this conspiracy, then certainly that conspiracy would be known to all of these other confidential human sources, right? That many of them were in the same chats. They would be able to confirm it. Could we know who they are? Bring them on here. Did, did you ever hear about any of these insurrection plans? Did you hear about a plan to take over the podium? No. Oh, okay, if you would have, would you have told the FBI about it? Yeah, okay, great. So it didn't exist, right? Yeah, no, not as far as I know, it didn't. Next one, next one, next one, times 50. Would be a great defense, but they're not gonna be allowed to do that, I would suspect. But when the government does drip this information out, they say, well, okay, we did have a confidential human source or two, just a couple of them. And here we hand them over and it's just 12 of them. And they say total manpower is 12. Now, let's see if we have this exhibit down here at the document, bottom of this document, before we come back up here. Yeah, here you go. Here's what they referenced. Metro Police Department Investigative Services Bureau, the Narcotics and Special Investigations Division. This is from New York Avenue, D.C. Metro Police. It's a memo to the commander and the Special Operations Division, January 10th, 2021. They say this is a summary of the activity for the electronic surveillance unit. On December 12th through January 6th, it's a very important date right there, the ESU was called upon to assist the SOD. So we have an ESU unit, and then we have an SOD to assist the Special Operations Division unit during civil disturbance and First Amendment demos. While assisting with the SOD, members of the ESU captured video and photographic evidence. The total manpower on the ESU team, they say, consisted of 12, two sergeants, three detectives, and seven officers. That's a total of 12. I'm pretty sure about that. Now, here's some more information about all these people. You have their names. Jacob Lipsko. We got Harris. But, you know, all the officers' names are here. I'm not going to read all 12 of them. They're listed here. There's more details about what they did. It says Officer Ryan was dispatched here, going to be taking photographs. He was recording this. They go through all of the names. It's signed off on by Tyrone Harris, the sergeant. And all of these people are listed here. But then when the government prosecutors turn over somebody, actually the witnesses, to be interviewed by the defense, guess what? A new player enters the game. This name is not on that list. Who is this person? Thomas Sula. No, I didn't recognize it from that list. Now, Officer Thomas Sula says, no, yeah, I was there. And uh, I, looks like he says he was a part of it, but his name was not on any of the lists who was previously disclosed. Why? Not assigned the same way. Oh, interesting. That's great. Why weren't you assigned the same way? Was it to keep your name off of a list? Maybe. 
Officer Tomasula indicated that he had gone undercover among the protesters on J6. He was a part of the Narcotics Special Investigation Division. This was in response to a 1033 code announced by Officer Glover asking everyone to come on J6. Tomasula said that he was ordered, had been told to go to the Trump speech on J6 and, quote, blend into the crowd. Oh, like a Trumper. Hmm. And there were about 10 to 12 others from Tomasula's previously not disclosed unit who were there. Uh Uh-oh. So we had a whole list that said total manpower was 12. Turns out it's more like 24. Amazing. Weird. Now, you can see this email they're referencing says 10 to 12 others from Tomasula who were not there. This is a note that on Friday, April 7th, revelations are in conflict with another email. A prosecutor called Ballantine on April 3rd sent an email to all of the defense lawyers on April 3rd. Here's what they said. Government prosecutor on April 3rd. Uh, Dear Mr. Hull and defense lawyers, says, I'm attaching a summary of the Metro PD's ESU deployments, the one that we just saw that was only 12 strong, which I provided you in discovery on Friday. Attaching a summary of what I gave you on Friday. Hmm. Now that sets forth the officers and the members who were conducting plain clothes surveillance. I'm also aware that Thomas Sula, Callahan and Brown volunteered to do at least some ESU shifts during that time frame. And I was looking for the rest of the footnote. Okay, so we'll just continue on. I'm not sure if that footnote gets continued. That's the email. So he's referencing the email. Now, he continues. He says, most significantly of all, Thomas Sula, this new officer who appeared out of nowhere, said that his assignment was simply to record evidence on his body cam. That's it. Just go stand around and record evidence. But he said he didn't know if the other 10 to 12, quote, narcotics officers were recording at all. Do they have body cameras? Don't know. Do you know what they were doing? Don't know. Were they doing a similar thing to you? Defendant has not been provided with the body cam footage in any case at all. Now, the defense was asking Tomasula, they have a fun time interviewing this guy. They go, well, we don't even know who you are, where you came from, or how you ended up here, but okay. But Tomasula said he had destroyed his iPhone and all of his text messages, interesting, including apparently messages about the Proud Boy structure and the recruitment relating to January 5th and January 6th. Uh, All of that had been auto-deleted. He said, isn't that nice? And pretty interesting, huh? So if you're a J6er and you delete anything, they say you're covering up evidence, aren't you? You're trying to hide material. Why would you delete your messages and leave these groups? You're covering something up like an insurrection, aren't you? We've heard that throughout this entire trial. Oh, and then you deleted it, right? So that's curious. So why are the government agents deleting evidence? Thomas Sula who was not on the list, who shows up on the case, the defense says, wait a minute, you're with 10 to 12 other people. You're all there. You're all recording body cameras. We don't have any of the body cameras. Neat. So you were there and can we see your cell phone? I mean, did you have any other messages? Because what the defense has just struck is gold. They have this witness that they don't have discovery on and they're going, what the heck else do you have? You have your phone on you? Okay, you have your email account. Do you, uh, is your wife here? Is, uh, and who else is here? We're going to get all of it. We want to capture everything. So they start asking him and he says, oh gosh, you know what? Hmm, strange thing happened. You know, my iPhone? Yeah. And pff, they're the darndest thing. And all the text messages on there too. Apparently text messages directly related to this case, related to the Proud Boys and recruitment had been auto-deleted. Oh man. Government evidence just evaporates. Thomas Sula said that there were meetings before being deployed, but the defense counsel has no reports whatsoever of those meetings. Hmm. 
And it's interesting because the government is trying to prove that there's a conspiracy to insurrect the country. And one key defense might be that maybe there was an exacerbation of this entire ordeal by the federal agents. And you're allowed to make that defense. And it certainly looks like that by the numbers. And if there is a defense to this stuff, it's that there was no intent to do a conspiracy anyways. And that the defense would be proven by showing that all of the conversations with all of the FBI informants show that there is no indicia of a conspiracy. You don't have to prove that the FBI was conspiring to create January 6th to create a defense for the Proud Boys to show they didn't have intent to just meet the checkboxes. It doesn't have to be this massive counter conspiracy. There's just not enough evidence in this case if only the jurors could hear it. And he admitted that he himself had been heard on the video. Tomalusa himself is screaming on the camera, whose house, our house? And he's saying, stop the thing. Defense writes, again, this content would have been absolutely exculpatory if it had been timely provided to the defense. If we were able to see this, we could have plastered this all over the cameras for the jurors to see that the cops were the ones who were initiating this. Thomas Sula indicated that he would have, did you write any reports about this officer? Did you write a report? Well, I would have, I would have immediately written reports of any violence or, or violent talk or any violent insurrectionist plans among the Proud Boys, but I reported none. He says, actually, I would have. I didn't, I didn't in this case, if they would have been insurrecting America, I would have reported about it, but I didn't have any indication of that. So such information says the defense would have been nice to have weeks ago when the defendants were cross-examining government witnesses and developing their defenses. The trial is now likely in its final week. So the government was able to keep the lid on this thing until the very end, right? Just get it through. Just ram it in there. Doesn't matter. Just shove her in there and shut the door. She'll fit. And not only were these undercover MPD officers watching the activities of the crowd, but they also, according to the defense team, says they incited the crowds into acts of violence and into acts of open conflict as the crowd approached the building. And we covered that previously, where the police officers are calling out people in the crowd, gray hair, and cops are on camera firing and then saying, boom, got them. Boom, boom, got him. We still do not know the extent to which the crowd's First Amendment demonstrations were transformed into violence by undercover law enforcement officers. And the Tomalusa body cam video may just be the tip of a much larger iceberg. So the defense says Pozzola, accordingly, is entitled to a new trial so that he can subpoena all of these witnesses, have these witnesses identify each other in the videos in the crowds, and identify whether there are other Metro officers wearing GoPro or body cameras that day. And if there are other 10 to 12 other narcotics, quote, special investigative division undercovers, or any of the other 40 plus CHSs belonging to any one of these agencies, the FBI, the Metro, Homeland Security, if they're filming, if they're reporting or recording, the, the defense is entitled to this evidence. Pozzola reserves the right to demand a dismissal for Brady violations based upon this outrageous government conduct for not disclosing this evidence. Now, the defense continues. They tell us that the government prosecutors here have unlawfully held exculpatory evidence stemming from all agencies other than the FBI. Prosecutors here have been saying that the defense is only entitled to FBI materials, right? They have access to the entire government, but there are limitations on what the government has to go and get. If you're a defendant and you're asking, you know, the prosecutor to turn over discovery, you know, information about some abstract, the Department of Agriculture case or something, right? Something very far unrelated. They're going to say, the judge will say, they've got no obligation to go get that for you. Okay. Go get it yourself. But in this criminal case, the government is using that argument and they're trying to put a force field, a hula hoop, as we say, to contain the scope of this case from going outside and beyond the FBI, because they know that if that happens, well, the floodgates are going to be open. Pandora's box will be revealed and we'll see there are feds all over this case. 
So they want that to be buried, limit it to the FBI, say, oh, no, no, no. I mean, they're all irrelevant. Homeland Security was focused on foreign threats or uh, Metro PD was focused on, you know, littering or uh, misdemeanors. And this is a felony and this is sedition. And so it's all irrelevant. The defense is not entitled to it. The defense is saying, yes, we are. If there were 50 informants embedded in the context of the events right around our clients, we need to know about that. This past week is outlined, undersigned counsel consulted with the ranking U.S. attorney. So the defense attorney met with the government and was informed by her that the government is considering its Brady obligations only for the FBI. So the defense is not entitled to any evidence, according to the government, from confidential human sources, from HSI, from Metro PD, anybody else even though they may be very well a part of the story. Remember, they're charging Enrique Tario with crimes. He wasn't even there on the day of January 6th. So you see how far the tentacles will be allowed to go for the defense, not so for the government. Now, this means that across the board, all topics for all J6 defendants, the defense says the government has been systematically violating Brady. And this is not a question of the defendant's suspicions or their inferences or their conclusions. This is from their statements. They said in an email on April 4th, Ballantyne, U.S. prosecutor, responded to the lawyer's email. They said the following. They said, uh, Mr. Roots. Now, I don't know. Mr. Roots is the defense. They say Mr. Roots. That's how they sound in their emails. I don't know whether so-and-so or Jeremy Brown or sources for another agency. I don't know. They might work for HSI or they might work for Metro PD. I don't care. But even if they were, I don't see how that fact would even be relevant here because she's a prosecutor. She has no idea. Homeland Security, she says, I'm not even sure whatever that would be. You know, it's not the investigative agency in this case. It's not relevant here. What is the relevance of that person's name if they're related to another agency? And of course, the answer is, well, they might have information that's exculpatory to our clients that's in possession of the government. You may not think it's relevant to the case because you only want to keep this contained to the FBI, but that's not reality, right? The defense is allowed to know about these things, and then we can make the argument to the court. You don't get to tell us that there is just a whole you know, batch of information that's not accessible to us because you have deemed it's not relevant. We'll be the ones who get to deem whether it's relevant. We'd like a full list and we'd like to go into the judge and say, judge, yes, there are 50 people. We want all of them. The government says eight are relevant to us. We say it should be a hundred. The judge can split it and say, all right, well, here's 25. But that's the judge's decision, not the government's decision. The defense says this is not the law. And this is also not true. And this, they say, cannot be salvaged. This case is too far gone. If the U.S. Attorney's Office for D.C. has been operating under the rule that only FBI documents need to be screened for disclosure under Brady, then the constitutional rights of our clients have been dumped on. Our co-defendants and everything have been violated, and this criminal prosecution must be dismissed. And if you don't do that, you got to order a new trial. Now, while Brady obligations don't extend to the entirety of the government, but they do extend to the investigative agencies, right? That's kind of, that was my agriculture analogy. It, it, you know, there is limitations to this, but if the agencies were investigating J6 and they were standing there at the same scene, aren't they relevant? Because they are investigating in a law enforcement manner. Agencies related or who knew or who should have known that this would have been related to this case. They say here in the U.S. Capitol, the police are directly related and fully aware of the events on J6. Capitol Police is an agency of Congress, and Congress are the two primary alleged victims here. And so its immediacy to events and its geographic proximity, everybody is in close proximity to here. It's all relevant. Now, the defense says this is not the first warning that the government is systematically under disclosing information under Brady. They're artificially limiting disclosures and they're only releasing certain materials that they think were possessed by the FBI. What about all of the other footage from everything else? They say that most of the witnesses from the FBI have no firsthand knowledge of the events and they're just reporting and regurgitating reports, mostly from Capitol Police officers. 
says most FBI agents are not even investigating January 6 reports, but they're only sitting at desks reading reports from those who did investigate. Now, he writes about what Brady material requires, and he gives us some case law. Says that disclosure affects not only the prosecutor, but also the government, including its agencies. If a prosecutor just is only limited to giving you what they're, you know, what they can be bothered to find a prosecutor. Well, yeah, and that's a lot of work that's in the DHS building and that's in the MPD building. My office is here. FBI is right there. I'll go to the FBI, but the other stuff, I just don't think it's relevant or necessary. It's a lot of work. Well, it's an investigative agency that is directly related to the criminal prosecution of a group of defendants. It's relevant. So here the defense continues. They say, we suspect that there is much more evidence of collusion between law enforcement agencies regarding these informants, confidential sources and plain clothed agents among protesters that have not been disclosed. They say, for example, here's a couple ideas that we have covered. One, there is a joint terrorism task force involving multiple agencies that almost certainly facilitated integration between other agencies, a big group of people working on that day. And you may see this in your local towns. Here in Arizona, we have the East Valley Task Force that comes out every time there is a holiday. And it's a group of police. They all get activated and they go cite a bunch of people for tickets and DUIs. So similar thing here. How many of those people were undercover? There was also the U.S. Parks Counterterrorism Unit. How many people were embedded there? They had their own protocols. They had a uniform presence, according to the defense. And they were there every 15 minutes on patrol. We have another one. There was a Fort Myer counterterrorism unit that was there. How many people on that one? Another counterterrorism unit, primarily used for air defense. They were driving Patriot battery into the streets of DC, more feds. And there are other federal agencies which are notorious for implanting and embedding informants among dissident groups like the BATFE, DEA, no information about any of those agencies. So if you add them all up, how many are there really? In totality, Pozzola demands a declaration of a mistrial, demands a new trial, says the United States is not obliged to their obligations under Brady, and therefore this case should be dismissed. You see the certificate of service sent over to the U.S. Attorney's Office asking for a dismissal of the charges. And every day we see a new filing here. There are more and more confidential human sources that are being discovered by the defense. Whatever the total number will be is yet to be seen. We'll see what the judge says about this. The government will, of course, respond. And we'll see what they say and how the judge rules. Now, there was another interesting motion that I want to just briefly touch on. This was the discussion about bringing in an expert to discuss window damage. So this was an eight page filing. And you know, one of the things that you often neglect in a criminal case are damages. You're often thinking about the, the action. What was the thing that happened? Like the damage, the punch, the DUI, whatever it is. But often in one of the elements of crime, one element of crimes can often be you got to meet a certain threshold in value. In other words, if it's over $1,000 of damage, it's a felony. If it's under $1,000 of damage, it's a misdemeanor. If it's over $2,000, it's a worse felony than if it's $1,000, right? Many statutes are structured this way. And so the defense wants to bring in somebody to analyze the glass because one of the indictment charges is saying that Dominic Pozzola broke some glass. And so the defense says, not so fast there, buddy boy. They want to bring in this guy called Duffy Hoffman, one of the most amazing window replacement and valuation experts of historic buildings. He's replaced over 20,000 panes of glass at various projects at homes on Capitol Hill and elsewhere. And he's going to come in here and he's going to testify about the national standards for billing and for valuation about the window that was described in count seven of Mr. Pozzola's charges. He's going to testify that under no normal, conventional, or recognized injury standard, 
could the damage to the window be as valued as high as one thousand dollars or more? And he's like, that's ridiculous. A thousand bucks. He's like, I can I could fix that for a hundred dollars. Give me a hammer and a screwdriver. <laughs> he's no problem. Mr. Hoffman is also going to testify, but it's the government, of course. So that same hammer, that set of screws, you know, for them, it's going to be, I don't know, 1.5 million, probably, probably need to ship it over to Ukraine first and make sure they can look at it and send it back or whatever they're doing with that money. Mr. Hoffman will also testify regarding the inadequacy of the invoicing and the billing that have occurred thus far in trial. Now they've notified the defense about this. They say this person is absolutely needed to come in on direct exam. They're talking about the, the costs of this. They say this misled a jury. The window is not a high price window and the valuation is improper. And so the jury should be allowed to hear this witness and please let our expert come in and testify for the defense. And here's a little bit more about him. Sounds like an amazing dude. Duffy Hoffman preservation specialist for historic structures. It's not even a big deal. All right. So all of these numbers that they're also talking about millions of dollars of damage, this guy's like, no, no, look at this, all this experience. I'll, I'll fix it in no time. I'm fixed in a weekend. Not even a big deal. Relax. All right. So <laughs> that's, that is from another expert witness. All of that in the Dominic Pozzola efforts as day 53 of the Proud Boys trial continues. Now we have more to get to here. Some other very interesting motions from the defense attorney, Carmen Hernandez. Zachary Real, defendant in the Proud Boys trial, files a motion for a mistrial and a motion to dismiss his obstruction charge. We'll take a look at both of them. The motion for the mistrial is based on this idea that Zachary Real is not like the others. Which one of these things is not like the others? Which one of these things just doesn't belong here? Carmen Hernandez, the defense attorney representing Mr. Real, who you see here, is saying that he was not violent. He wasn't even involved in many of these conversations. He was not even involved in many of the physical locations and saying that if you want to make sure that he's involved in a conspiracy, which is what they're being charged with, seditious conspiracy, you got to have some sort of independent evidence that establish his him as a part of the conspiracy. He's got to be independently verified as a conspirator. You can't just say, well, all of these other guys did something and you were kind of like near them and therefore you're a part of the conspiracy. You got to show that he took some sort of volitional action. He did some things that put him in with the rest of the group. And thus far throughout the trial, there hasn't been much that they have shown. So let's take a look at these two different motions. The first one came in. This is the motion for a mistrial, shorter filing, five pages, USA versus Zachary Real. And this was filed by Carmen Hernandez. She writes that the motion to strike, this is a motion to strike out of court statements and declare a mistrial, saying that it is now appropriate judge after what we have seen take place in this courtroom to strike, eliminate, remove parlor, telegram, and other messages that this judge conditionally admitted by the court on the basis that the next necessary factual predicates for their admissibility have not been met. So this is a little bit of a technical argument, but she's saying the judge allowed certain statements to come in on the basis that something else would be proven. And that other thing was not proven. Therefore, the statements that came in got to go out. And if you don't do that, if you don't throw those out, well, actually, you do have to throw them out and declare a mistrial because those statements that you allowed in were so damaging that this trial is irredeemable. Nothing can be salvaged. The defense says, as the prejudice from the extensive materials that were introduced cannot be cured, we now move for a mistrial. Now, this is a little bit technical, but it is interesting. They say that there is a conditional admission of evidence standard. And when you have co-conspirators, in this case, you've got co-defendants, five Proud Boys, they say that they were going to sedition, engage in seditious conspiracy to take over the country. Certain statements that are hearsay can be admitted under the rules. The judge in his discretion may permit the introduction of things that were said and done by alleged co-conspirators. But the court may strike the testimony 
if it has not been sufficiently connected to the rest of the case. Because you can't implicate somebody by just saying they were loosely affiliated with a broader conspiracy. You need more direct evidence. And so she's saying, judge, we're asking you here to dismiss. In the instant case, this court rejected our suggestion. The judge let the evidence in on the presumption that the underlying condition would be met and it wasn't met. The judge said, well, the better practice is for the court to determine and make a ruling in a different way. And so she's referencing the rules. She says here, the court must make two independent decisions. And in the instant case, the government has failed to do that. There is no substantial independent evidence of a conspiracy, writes Carmen. There's no evidence of Mr. Real's participation in one. Neither Bertino nor Green, two other people, the two cooperating witnesses who testified, testified that they were aware of any agreement to commit a seditious conspiracy, nor were they aware of Mr. Real's involvement in them. Bertino nor Green, neither of them testified to being aware of any conspiracy to corruptly obstruct the proceedings. And Green did not know and had never spoken to Mr. Real. He was acquainted with Mr. Pozzola only slightly. He traveled to a car in D.C. with another person. He was not even a proud boy. Green indicated he knew of no plan, no agreement to come to D.C. to commit a conspiracy. He owned small weapons. He didn't bring any of those weapons with him. The insurrection without massive troves of weapons. While in D.C., he said he acted spontaneously, just as things developed. Similarly, Bertino did not indicate that he had ever spoken with Real about these conspiracies. Nobody was talking about it. And although he was close to Tario and spoke with him on January 6, Bertino knew of no plan to attack the Capitol. No other person testified to being involved with any of the conspiracies. The only evidence that was introduced were statements that were conditionally admitted by the court, but which the court can't consider unless it's supported by substantial independent evidence. And because the government has failed here, a mistrial is warranted. When the government fails to prove the existence of a conspiracy, by providing that independent evidence, it must give the jury a curative instruction. In this case, these out-of-court statements were so extensive, it's all inadmissible hearsay, and therefore the court must declare a mistrial. From Carmen Hernandez representing Zachary Real, good motion. Now we'll see what Judge Kelly does about that, and the judge will wait for the government to issue their response. But this was just one of two motions that Ms. Hernandez filed. The other motion was a motion to dismiss based upon the Court of Appeals ruling. And I want to cover this briefly before we jump into the trial. But this filing is a motion to dismiss just that one single count, the obstruction charge. She says that there's a, an appropriate time now to bring this back up. Says that historically, the court denied a very similar motion when we filed this the first time. You denied it again when we filed it a second time. But now we're filing it again. Why? Because the Court of Appeals has issued a ruling. And if you read it carefully, they're saying it requires dismissal of the obstruction charge. Now, we read through this full opinion, not the full opinion, it was quite long, but we skimmed through the majority and the dissent, and we really gleaned over the concurring opinion. But the concurring opinion is being latched onto here because the concurring opinion says that they join Judge Pan's opinion only conditionally, but if the condition is not met, that he would join the dissent. Okay, so it's a very weird concurring opinion. You don't ever see concurring opinions like that. This concurring opinion sounds like it's not really a concurring opinion. It's like a conditional. If this, then with the majority, but if not, then with the dissent. And so we're sitting here going, well, gosh, that's kind of a predicament because the thing that you're considering a conditional is kind of the reason we're in your court right now. Kind of need you to decide that. You know what I mean? So pick a side. And we flipped over that, but apparently he didn't pick a side. And so we don't actually have a ruling on it. Go figure. So Judge Walker also posits that his opinion should control because if the unmet condition 
that he places in his concurrence, they say that Judge Katsis, the dissent, is the only opinion that receives two votes because we can't decide what the opinion was. So we don't really know what the ultimate Court of Appeals ruling was. The defense is making an argument here that there is no clarity on this. And because there's no clarity, you got to default towards the dissent. The majority opinion, in fact, is not the majority opinion. They say the dissent is clear that the conduct only covers conduct that impairs the availability of the evidence. And we were asking ourselves specifically about what type of conduct was prohibited in these charges. And as we talk a lot about here, there are check boxes that you have to uh, check in a criminal charge and you go through the list. So, you know, were they in the Capitol building in a place they shouldn't have been? You know, do they have identification? Did they obstruct corruptly something? Well, you ask yourself, what does uh, obstructing mean? What does corruptly mean? And you're breaking down this phrase. What does impairing the integrity and the availability of evidence mean? And so we went through a lot of the analysis on this. A lot of word games were being played. But when we fast forward through it, the, ju the, the defense is saying, you can see here, copying large portions of the opinion and saying that the narrow reading of corruptly was a necessary condition to his vote. And because we can't prove that that condition has been met, the obstruction charge must be dismissed because we don't actually have a full vote because we can't prove that the condition has been met. So another very interesting filing from Carmen Hernandez. We'll see what she's asking for here as we fast forward to the conclusion so we can drop right into the trial for the day. You see here. Wherefore, Mr. Real respectfully requests this court reconsider its decision, dismiss counts two and three of the indictment, calling them unconstitutionally vague and in violation of Zachary Real's rights to a fair trial. Signed by Carmen Hernandez, defense counsel for Real. So two big filings there for Zachary Real as well. And when you add that up with all of the other filings, we've got Dominic Pizzola. And we have new revelations of 50 plus informants popping out of the woodwork everywhere we turn. We'll see what Judge Kelly starts to rule as the trial continues. Let's turn our attention there as we get into trial. Day 53. Proud Boys trial, day 53. We're checking in with Brandy Buckman, at Brandy Buckman on Twitter. She tells us, courtroom filling in, defense attorneys piling in, the jury's not coming in until a little bit later. But she's going to start live tweeting for us. And prosecutors are also arriving. And Eric, one of the prosecutors, got a haircut over the weekend. Remember, they were gone on Monday. They came back. This is the first day back. Nice that the prosecutor finally got a haircut. Judge Kelly is back on the bench, all rise. Uh, and he comes in and he goes, yes. Uh. He's looking at the defense. You people filed a lot of motions, didn't you? Of course, we just read through all of them. He says, I guess the first place that we're going to start is what are we going to do with the schedule? He says, well, First thing we can do here, we have a little bit of a juror problem. Hmm. Prior commitment on Thursday and Friday. He says, well, I'm not going to dismiss this juror. I have a uniform objection to doing that. And I should make it clear that this is a work-related obligation that cannot be adjusted. All right. The question is, do we dismiss for cause or do we continue with this person? All the defendants want to keep this person. Government wants to dismiss him. Government's like, yeah, yeah, let him go. Yeah, let him go. You know, probably a white guy, probably something like that. No, he's busy. He's got to work, you know, get him out of here. And the defense is like, no, we're keeping him big time. And continue on hearing uh, on Thursday and Friday. To some degree, they're weighing the risks. Kelly says, well, I'm not going to dismiss him. Can we get through this by Friday, Thursday, Friday is what they're saying. Now, there's a couple other motions that are piling in here. He says, I want to talk about these two evidence, uh, these two motions. One of those was about Roger Roots. He's asking about the window expert. 
He says, you know, I read through your motion, Roger. I'll, I'll think about it and I'll rule on it. You want to be heard on this? And they say, sure. And Roger says, yeah, I wrote that motion. He says, the government responded to us after our questions with a brush off. I was complaining about Brady obligations. And they said that they don't have to give me anything that's outside of the FBI. He says, like the Jeremy Brown case. They showed that there were other Oath Keepers, there were other informants who were being recruited by Homeland. He says, it's an insult to us. This is Roger arguing his motion. That the FBI may have this kind of information. They may have agents in other agencies and they don't tell us. It's insulting. We have a reason to believe that the State Department was there. The National Park was there. Police had undercover and we know that they did more than just monitor the situation, Judge. If they monitor these Proud Boys and the defendants up and to the events leading up to January 6, even merely monitoring it is exculpatory because they could show we could show that there is no insurrection underway. But we got to see the evidence so we can get the materials and craft our story. Root says, we've got evidence from the police, the Metro police, saying that there's a surveillance squad that, the, that they were confronted by police. And they, they told police that they were armed and police let them go. And then those informants incited the crowd. He says, this case, Your Honor, this case, it's fundamentally tarnished. It's poisoned by this lack of information. We would have used this information during our cross-examination weeks ago. And we would have used it to present our cases in chief right now. And so there's nothing else we can do. This case requires a mistrial. Now. Judge Kelly has a snarky response. He says, well, I'm very surprised to hear you say that, Mr. Roots, you know, that saying that just chanting something is incitement. He's saying, well, your clients are basically, we're doing a bunch of chanting. Interesting to call that incitement. Prosecutor chimes in too. He says, gosh, uh, judge, I agree with you. So the prosecutor and the judge are having a little, uh, you know, patty cake time. Says, I agree, Judge. Yeah, I'm troubled to hear Mr. Roots refer to the government as intellectually insulting in light of the characterization that he, an officer of the court, presents to the court about information that he learns of. Somebody says, we've been scrupulously accurate, Ballantine prosecutor. We've been accurate about case law. We've been truthful about Brady. And we've been disclosing all the things that we need to disclose. We've disclosed 65 videos from the officers that were acting as roving cams. And he's been in possession of those for years and three months. And the allegation that all this comes too little too late, the prosecutors fired up. Candidly, this may just be a simple reflection of the fact that Roger Roots joined this trial team after trial already commenced. And clearly he's not had enough time to review the materials. But that is not the case with his very capable counsel, Stephen Metcalf. Ooh, throw in shade. She's trying to divide these defense attorneys. Now she continues. She says, and with respect to Jeremy Brown, he's got a trial date that's not even set yet. And whether he was recruited to be a CHS of another agency is completely immaterial to the actions of the Proud Boys. The consistent theory your honor has applied to CHSs is this, where those sources were in a position to know and hear about information about the Proud Boys or where there were percipient witnesses to the Proud Boy activities, that information is material to the prep of the defense. And government says we've worked diligently to try and ID that info and disclose it to the defense. We've been doing everything we can. She says at the heart of the defense motion is the claim that there's another CHS amongst the Proud Boys. For Department of Homeland Security unit, he's not been able to ID to us. We've done diligent research of FBI holdings, agencies closely aligned. They say whatever that means, agencies closely aligned. And we found no evidence of this individual. He even is a source. And she says, and Your Honor, by the way, I have to say, you know, the very fact that someone has a source relationship with the FBI, that doesn't mean that that's exculpatory, nor does the fact that the Metro PD had plainclothes officers monitoring the activities, none of that's exculpatory per se, meaning automatically, which I would agree. I would agree that just the fact that the FBI has sources is not by itself 
exculpatory. We're talking about sources that were there on January 6 during the event in the proximity with the Proud Boys. That is relevant because those sources are there. You charge the Proud Boys for doing the things that they did for being there and talking the way that they did. We want to see if other people who are in their close proximity, if they were sources, what they were perceiving, being on the receiving end of all of it. She says, and specifically, particularly when, as the government has done, to make officers that the defense requested, not the ones that the government provided, those officers told the defense that the PD was there to keep the Proud Boys away from Antifa. And the judge is shaking his head. Yeah, appears to be in agreement with Ballantine. So Judge Kelly says, all right, your motion's denied. All right, you're not getting anything here. Uh, your motion to dismiss from Roots is denied. Sorry, not denied. You're not able to mistrial. Not going to happen. He says, I'm also going to address the motion that Carmen Hernandez filed for Zachary Real. I wanted to be able to table that discussion, but I'm not going to grant that either. I'm not inclined to grant it. So just get ready for that. Big surprise. Nobody's surprised. The defense says, that's fine. We're going to peel all this crap anyways. Thanks for nothing, Judge. Uh, so the only other witness teed up right now is an investigator called by defendant Zachary Real. They're wrapping up their conversation about some of the witnesses. Roots is now arguing. He says, Judge, we would have had a different trial strategy if we would have known about these undercover cops. And Carmen Hernandez agrees, says, Judge, look, we didn't get enough time on any of this stuff. All of it prejudiced our case. I already filed my motion. You saw it. You're going to deny it. No problem. That's fine. I figured you would. We're going to take it up on appeal when we get there. Brandy says, I'd give anything to see the notes Judge Kelly's taken. Yeah. Says, uh, Ethan Nordine, Henry Tario, they join the statements. They're talking about the expert witness. They're taking a break. Now, there is some good testimony that's coming up from Zachary Real. So I want to make sure we fast forward to that a little bit and get past some of the preliminary stuff. Here's some argument about the Court of Appeals. Judge Walker, Ethan Nordine is arguing, says the concurrence is binding, Your Honor. It's not the majority, it's the concurrence. Judge Kelly says, I don't want to hear about it. I'm going to think about it, and I'm not going to hear about it now. So we're fast forwarding through the preliminaries. They finish up, and they take a break. Judge Kelly says, hey, good news for the defense. You want to bring in your window expert? Oh, you're denied. Sorry. He's going to grant the government's motion to deny the window expert. So, of course. So, all of the motions to dismiss are denied. The motion for the window expert, denied. Sorry. That's not coming in either. He says, I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> so, it just continues on. Kelly now moves to asking defendants. All right. Which one of you people are testifying? And he's going around the table. And he's asking all the defendants, all the proud boys very serious moment. At this time, proud boy insurrectionist defendants were nearing the close of the presentation of evidence in your trial. As you know, you do have the right to testify should you so choose. And he goes down the table. He goes to Ethan Nordine first. Mr. Nordine? Will you be testifying, sir? He says, my lawyer just said I'm not testifying. Judge says, sir, your attorney, other than this last witness and the investigator being called by real, your counsel has said that he intends to rest. And the judge has given them a little talk. All of them are going to get this. I want to make sure you know that you do have the right to testify on your own behalf here. Well, whether you do so or not, that's something you should discuss with your lawyer and get their advice. But ultimately, that decision is yours and yours alone. Now, I'm going to tell the jury 
If you don't testify, I'm going to tell the jury not to hold that against you. You're clear about that, Mr. Nordeen. He talks to his lawyer. He, he, yeah, he says, yeah, subject to what my lawyer said, I will not be testifying. Okay. Now he turns over to Joe Biggs, does the same thing. Mr. Biggs, do you understand? Yes, I do. And what is your decision? I intend not to testify. Judge turns over to Enrique Tario. Enrique Tario stands up. Attorney stands next to him. He gets the rights. He says, yes, your honor, on my conversation with my attorney and based on objections that were filed in my case, I am not going to be testifying on my behalf. Now, Husher comes on in the courtroom. Jurors return. And let's see here. They're arguing about a witness. Judge Kelly comes out. Says the courtroom is already jammed. They're talking about some accommodations for a witness. Now, apparently this witness is going to be accompanied by a marshal. Deciding how a witness will physically take a witness stand. So the jury is now going to come in after they figure that out. And the investigator for Zachary Real is going to be taking the stand. Zachary Real might be testifying. We'll see. Now, the jury takes their seats, and Judge Kelly starts with an advisory. He says, all right, everybody, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we've got a few things, housekeeping items. We are going to hear evidence today and tomorrow. We are not going to sit for evidence on Thursday and Friday of this week. <clears throat> says, we do expect you'll receive the case next week for deliberation. Now, Reel's witness takes the stand. Uh, Your Honor, the defense calls David Jones. He walks up to the witness stand. Uh, Mr. Jones, can you tell me a, a little bit about your background? He says, sure. Yeah, I'm a licensed private investigator in Washington, D.C. He's sitting there, a white male. Oh, great. Middle-aged, larger in build. Oh, he's got muscles, a dark suit too, light shirt and glasses, no facial hair. How long have you been a private investigator? Says he's been a private investigator since 1997. How about before that? What'd you do? He says, well, I used to work in the U.S. Navy. I was a UMD grad. What was your position in the Navy? Objection, says the prosecutor. We don't want to hear about his credentials. Judge overrules it. Says, I was in intelligence collecting and cryptography. Oh, pretty smart, huh? That's why he's not working for the FBI. That's why he's a private investigator. Does that have something to do with your current work? He says, no, I don't think so. Now, Jones affirms, he says, I've been working with you guys for a while. You've been working with us, right? Yeah. And you got appointed as an investigator through the court? Yeah. Now, what does that entail? What, is, what happens when you get appointed as an investigator? He says, well, you know, I go through police reports and computer data. And I look at videos and wiretaps and undercover wires and all sorts of stuff. And I gave you some documents and some materials to review here for this trial. Is that true? Yeah. You recognize this? Yeah. And you've looked at this a couple times? Yeah. Now, I want you to look at the first 20 seconds or so. This is the clip of a barrier being brought down on the Capitol on J6. He says, do you know who took this video? Carmen Hernandez asks. Well, I think Mr. Real took that video. It says 1254.09. That was the metadata on the timestamp from his phone. And Hernandez says, did you hear say someone say F it storm the Capitol when I just played that objection overruled says Jones says, well, I can hear something. He says, obviously I hear chanting, you know, USA. He says, I obviously hear noises of the crowd. He said, but did you hear someone say F it and storm the Capitol in the same phrase objection? And it's overruled again. 
he says, yeah, I, yeah, I hear something, something similar to that. Hmm. Now I want you to listen to it again. He says, well, I can hear it as well on this copy played in court, but yeah, but I could hear it on an identical copy I've reviewed before. He says, I listened to it, you know, when I had headphones on and I could hear it then. So you listened to it before and you were able to hear it. They come back. How many times have you worked this case? About a year. How often have you spoken to Zachary Real? Uh, talked to him 12 times. Ever person to person? He says, yes, I've met with him multiple times. Yeah, each meeting was in person over two hours. He's an investigator on the case, worked on this for a long time. Uh, he says that I want to ask you about the voice in the video shot on the phone. Is that recognizable to you? Could you recognize his voice? So she's laying more foundation is what she's doing. They play through the video. Any other voices you recognize? He says, I think I hear real. Clear his throat and say, yeah, about four to five seconds at the end. Backing up the video, playing the video, backing up, playing the video. Did you hear it then? Did you hear it now? Yeah, I heard it. Were you able to tell where you heard it in terms of the counter at the bottom? Like what time? Well, it's very small. Play it. They identify it. It's at the 59 second mark. Now, is there any other reason you believe that voice is Mr. Real? He says, well, yeah, it sounds like it's in close proximity to the phone. And what did you infer from that? Well, that I believe it's Mr. Real, right? I mean, it's really close to the microphone. So he's talking right into it. But earlier before the 22nd mark, you didn't get that same condition, did you? Right. Now I want to play another clip for you. Biggs is on the video talking about what a historic day this was. And they play another clip. Do you see Johnson here? He says, yeah, he's engaged with the barrier and with the fence. And he appears to be pushing the fence. This is taking place at 1253. So they're watching the footage in court. And Carmen asks, are you able to identify from what you've seen anybody that you recognize in this footage? He says, yeah. Does this look like an accurate representation that you've been looking at of the same gentleman? Yeah. And from what you're seeing here, does it look like Jones says, uh, Jones says Johnson is in the video. And what's Johnson doing? Johnson's pushing down the barrier. So somebody else is pushing down the barrier. In the video, Jones, do you see Mr. Real, my client? No. They play some more footage. Hernandez is back at the podium, going through some notes. Now, I want to show you a document that might refresh your recollection. Shows him this document. Looks like it's a photograph. Can you identify Jones in this photograph? Can you ID this person? So the photograph is in front of him, draws a circle around the corner. Who is this person? That looks like it's defendant Dominic Pizzola. And you've been an investigator for how long? 25 years. And you've worked on a lot of digital cameras? Yeah. What's the purpose of taking photographs? Well, he says to memorialize a scene. Sometimes do lawyers ask you to take pics? Yeah. Sometimes do you take pics on your own? Yeah. What is the person taking a picture of here? Don't know. Objection overruled. Now they're getting closer to the scaffolding at the Capitol. Sidebar. Ends her questions from Joan. They go up for a sidebar. And that's it. No further questions. So the prosecutor, so I'm not sure what we really gleaned out of that testimony other than the fact that Zachary Real was not there or was not was not part of the original barrier going over. Okay, so now it's up for cross-examination. Investigator was up for a short time. Prosecutor comes out. Uh, Mr. Jones, you were shown a video of Paul Johnson, the guy who took the barrier down, right? Yeah. One of those videos was him near the Peace Monument. Yeah. And it showed him pushing down a fence, right? Yeah. 
And that offense says it wasn't bolted to the ground, was it? No, it didn't appear to be. And he pushed that fence down to advance on the Capitol, right? Yeah. And that's a violent action, objection, so you're characterizing. Uh, sustained on that one, wow. And so he's taking action so that he can proceed forward. Yeah, that's what it looks like. And so you saw Jones with a megaphone, right? And you also saw Biggs and Real and Nordine at the Peace Monument. He says, yeah, they were in the area. They also had megaphones. Yeah. But Paul Johnson wasn't with Real Biggs and Nordine in other parts in the mall that day, was he? Not that I saw. He pulls up a video. There's a video. Nordine's talking the, about the Proud Boys. Video plays. Carmen Hernandez is objecting. Biggs is seen in the crowd talking about food trucks. And he's getting him to say, so you were only watching them for a limited period of time. You didn't review all the actions that day, right? Right. Hushers on, hushers off. They're playing more video. And the prosecutor's asking him about other footage. Did you see Johnson in there? No. Do you hear the Proud Boys? Yes. Prosecutor continues on. You hear them saying F the police. He says, a storm the Capitol. Who's saying storm the Capitol? He's saying, I can't say who that is. Objections are sustained. And McCullough ends the cross-examination. Now, we're going to fast forward. Uh, there's very brief cross-examination. They go to lunch. And we fast forward through lunch. And uh-oh, guess what we got? We're back. The parties have made their way into the courtroom. Carmen Hernandez is going to be calling her own client, proud boy, Zachary Real. Judge says, all right, Carmen, what's going on right now? Is Zach going to testify? And she says, well, he has to waive his Fifth Amendment right and consider advice of counsel. Says, I would like to know about these rulings on other charges. But Kelly says, we'll decide those things later. No authority for that now. Is your client testifying today? Yes or no? Kelly turns over to Zachary Real. Mr. Real, your attorney has said that she intends to arrest your case and you do have a right to testify on your own behalf if you are here and you are. Now, whether or not you do so, you should discuss with your lawyers, but the decision is ultimately yours and yours alone. If you do testify, I'll tell the jury they should consider a decision not to testify to be held against you. Do you understand that, Mr. Real? He says, yes, your honor, I do. And I still seek to testify. Now, Carmen Hernandez is objecting. She does not want a U.S. Marshal to be sitting next to Real because a U.S. Marshal sitting next to Real will look bad for the jurors. The defendants are in court now in plain clothes, which is pretty typical, which is typical when you're being on trial because you don't want the jurors to look at you in handcuffs and in chains and in orange jumpsuits. Otherwise, it might bias, it might prejudice them. So defendants get plain clothes. They get suits and ties, even though they're being held unnecessarily in custody. Zachary Real in particular for not even doing anything violent. So they're there in court. That's what they're looking like. And we have... A, an objection to the U.S. Marshals coming in there and sitting next to him making things look bad. Now, in some ways, Kelly realizes 
that if we bring the marshal over, apparently they think that Zachary Real might attack and insurrect the jurors or insurrect the courtroom. The defense says, your honor, this is ridiculous, okay? He's presumed innocent. He shouldn't even be in custody. And the degree to, that there's any suggestion that a man presumed innocent is a flight risk, like he's going to run out of here, then it has a tendency to implicate co-defendants, so we want to register a strong dissent. You treating him like he's a flight risk or like a danger is ridiculous, given the fact that this is a he's still not convicted of anything yet. Says, I've never seen this. A man cloaked in the presumption of innocence being treated differently at the most important moment of his life in this trial. Kelly says, I understand the objection. And Hernandez chimes in. She's objecting. Brah! Judge says, Miss Hernandez, if I could just get a word in ed edgewise, please says, again, I understand. Look, I don't begrudge you all making these arguments, but I'm not going to have marshals alter procedures they use in every single case in this courthouse. And I do think where the marshal is ultimately going to be seated here is less and further out of the way between the view of the jury and the defendant in a way I think does our best to minimize our issue. But I understand your objections. So is Zachary Real, a man who has not been convicted of anything, a man who, according to her defense team, has been shown to have engaged in zero violence throughout this entire course of the trial. The evidence has been lacking that there was any independent corroboration for his involvement at all. He has been in custody, not allowed to be out and spend time with his newborn daughter, who I believe is two. And the judge is going to just sort of mosey him, uh, him on up to the witness stand and have this lurching U.S. Marshal, just kind of hovering over him, watching him. You better not run. You better not do any insurrection furtive movements or else we'll take you out. And you know that body language. You know the jurors are watching this little dance occur. Zachary Real stands up. I'm going to go and testify stalking him on the way up to the witness stand. The judge says, well, he is an insurrectionist. The defense is outraged. Your Honor, may I ask? And something happens inaudible. Kelly says, well, you know, I thought we all had numerous witnesses in this case. And I want to move things forward. And so the marshals are going to have to walk with real to the witness stand. That's it. I've made my ruling. And the jury's not going to think anything unusual about it, okay? They're not even going to notice. So that's how we're going to proceed. Jury's still waiting. Now, the prosecutor says, uh, Judge, you know, yeah, given the sheer volume in this case and the count, uh, the government's given everything to the defense. We obviously don't know how long the direct will go or whether we're going to finish this today. We're asking about afternoon breaks. They're asking about the length of time on direct. Carmen says, I don't know, judge. I'm a very bad length of, uh, I, I can't gauge time. And they're talking about schedules. They'll say, we'll get there when we get there. Defense calls proud boy, Zachary Real to the stand. You promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but truth, so I'll be God? Yes, I do. Carmen Hernandez takes to the podium. Says, all right, Mr. Real. Take a deep breath before the jury enters. He smiles broadly. Moves his water glass to a corner. And the jury comes in. He is turned to face them briefly, smiles at them, rotates his chair a bit back and forth, and the jury piles in. Reels in court. Hair is neatly cut and combed. He's got a slender build, wearing a dark suit, light-ish shirt, dark tie. Jury sits, Tario Nordine and their attorney stand. Pozzola and Big stay seated, and then Pozzola stands. 
Now the jury wasn't there before. So when Zach was, was smiling, it was just at the marshal. Now real is sworn in. Carmen Hernandez says, Mr. Real, are you nervous here today? He says, ah, a little bit, but I'll be all right. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? He says, yeah, sure. I'm 37. I'm married. My wife's here in the courtroom here today. I've got a daughter turned 18 and I have a younger daughter her two, who turned one just a few months ago. He's been in custody this entire time. Hernandez says, I want to show you a picture of your daughter. He says, yeah, that's her. Just as cute today as she was the first time they saw the photo. She's adorable, says Brandy. Love that going out to the jurors. Tell me about your family, Real. He says, well, I got one brother. Uh, my dad died when I was 12 years old. Tell me about your dad. My dad, he was a, an officer, Philly police force, but he didn't pass away in the line of duty. And what happened after your dad died? Well, it was a bit of a rocky time. After that, my mom didn't have a lot of money, and so we bounced around from hound to house. And my mom was a bartender. I was 16. I left, went to live with my brother, lived somewhere else also with a cousin at some point. Did you graduate from high school? Zach says, yeah. I went to a preparatory high school. And then after I graduated, I went and worked in the cellular business for T-Mobile and Nextel. You still live in Philly? He says, yeah, I live in Philly. Been there my whole life. I grew up there, was a caddy, age 14. Worked at a movie theater, age 16. Started selling cell phones when I turned 18. And did there come a time when you joined the Marines? He says, yeah, actually. I went from selling phones to mattress sales to selling cars. And then when I was selling cars, 2008 happened, and we all know what happened. Anyone with credit couldn't get approved for a car, so... I felt that option, so I joined the military. Where'd you serve? He says, my duty station was in Yuma, Arizona, near the border of California and Mexico. Now, Hernandez goes to bring up an exhibit, and Real says, don't you want to zoom out a little bit? Zoom out, she says. And he smiles at her, and he makes a hand gesture like he's expanding something and says, zoom out. The picture shown to the jury shows real and two other men. Sergeant Major Marine Corps picture, but not his commanding officer. It's an appointed position talking about one Sergeant Major in the Marines. Real testifies that there was a time in 2010, 2011, where the Sergeant of the Marine Corps was visiting a base for a ceremony. This picture was from that time. What'd you do when you were in the Marines? Well, I was a supply position, basically. He said, I'm kind of like a glorified FedEx kind of a thing. He says, we did work with FedEx as well. So he's kind of chuckling nervously. Did you see combat? He says, no, I did not. When you joined the Marines, was there a war going on? He says, yes, I'm not sure we were out of Iraq, but at that point, no, I don't think we were. He says his brother was also in the Marines. And when you were there, you suffered a shoulder and a back injury. Is that true? He says, uh, with six months service left. He says, I was let out early because of that injury. Did you have any honors when you were there? Yeah, I got a lot of them. I was an honors grad. I was meritoriously promoted from E2 to E3. And so your discharge, was it honorable? He says, yes, it was correct. Honorable discharge under medical. Hmm. When discharged, what was the highest rank you reached? He says, E4. So that'd be corporal. And were you seeing your wife at that time? He says, yeah, I met her on vacation. I used to get my oldest daughter six months of the year. And one time, uh, one of the times I was dropping her in Philly, I met my wife. We were introduced by friends. We stayed in contact and got married. And he says, well, tell me about your first daughter. Well, I got out of the Marine Corps. I went to Shippensburg University in Pennsylvania. Got my soon to be, found my soon-to-be wife in college there. Thought we'd go out and we'd go to college together. So he ended up switching colleges, went over to Temple, and his wife joined him. How did you pay for your education, Zach? He says, well, basically the GI Bill. I uh, says, I also did vocational rehab program, which is similar to a GI Bill. 
which gives you school full time with a stipend. He explains how all of that works, majored in finance and swapped over to marketing. It's a, tell me about your parents, Zach. Did they ever finish high school? He says, you know, I don't think they finished high school, to be honest with you. I think I'm the first one in my family to graduate college. Hernandez says that his grandfather was also a police officer in Philly. And so, Zach, when you graduated from college, that was kind of a big deal for you? He says, yeah, it was a big deal. Something I'm very proud of. You graduated in 2016? He says, yeah, I believe so. And then what? I tried to find a job in my field, and so I went back to school, and that's where I got my master's in innovation management and entrepreneurship. Innovation management, huh? What is that? He says, well, it's just kind of a cute name that Teppel came up with for engineering. Innovation management for engineering. Yeah. And how'd you do there? He says, I did pretty good. I got a 3.6 GPA, somewhere close to that. You're pretty proud of that? He says, yeah, absolutely. I mean, something I strive for since I got out of high school. Didn't have the means and the money to do it and just couldn't go. So to go to college, like some people did, you know, the military stepped in, allowed me to do that. So I'm grateful for that. Carmen asks, once your dad died, your mother and your brother and you, you had kind of difficult financial situations. Is that right? Yeah. You said you moved from house to house. You stayed with friends a lot. Well, I didn't say that. I mean, we did move a lot. How did Real come to know? How did you come to know Henry McGill? Another person. Well, I met him during my time in Yuma. We met at a bar. Nothing else to do in Yuma but drink and party. That is true. Shout out to Yuma. At first, he says, what was the name of the place you guys met? He says, gosh, you know, I don't even remember. No pressure, right? Says, we did similar work and hung out together. They were part owners of a bar. She says, Reel's kind of rambling on a little bit, talking about meeting aspiring rappers in a place where musicians could perform. And tell me more about McGill. He was a medic in the Navy. He was there a lot while he was there. And now we talk about Proud Boys. So you got your master's in 2013. And when did you decide to join the Proud Boys, Zach? 2018. Why'd you join? Well, there's not one single reason I could point to. Personally, I was doing certain events that I was involved with for one. Another reason I was just kind of trying to get my business up and running. When I was going to these events and rallies, I expanded my network a lot. I was on a radio show once, and this gentleman told me to look into the Proud Boys. I didn't know who they were, so I looked them up. I saw on a website that they had tenants, you know, like free speech and entrepreneurship. It didn't sound like what the media made them out to be. So I thought, I'm trying to expand my business and my network. Sounds great. So I decided to join. He says, you know, if you support something people think is wrong think, or you come out as a Trump supporter or something, you can lose your job and everything. And people go to great lengths to protect themselves in public. And says, my mom has been doxxed because of this trial. She received threats from unknown people, including messages. Carmen asks, are there a lot of military people in the Proud Boys? He says, yeah. I mean, every time I turned around, it seemed like there were. One of the things I ended up losing when I left the Marine Corps was the brotherhood with other Marines. I had to keep in contact with people, and I still did. But one of the really great problems was the lack of brotherhood. You know, if guys lose a job, they'd help them get a new job. They would help guys get on their feet. It was a brotherhood of love, you know. You can't put a price on that. It's true. Community and brothership, brotherhood and all of it is very important. Real says that he has some social anxiety. He says, I got a hard time meeting new people, but I do like to be social. He said, would, would, your, would somebody call you a party boy? He says, yes, actually, my uncle Tony would call me a party boy. He does, discusses the difference between the rally boys and the party boys, which we've talked a lot about here. The rally boys go to the rallies and, and do rally things. The party boys don't go to the rallies. They do party boy things. And so you're kind of a party boy. He says, yeah, I mean, we would go get lit. That's all it really. You're not suggesting that you didn't attend rallies, are you? 
No, no, no. I, I, I did attend rallies, but you also partied a lot. You know, oh, yeah, partied a lot. Would you say you have a drinking problem, Zach? Uh, I wouldn't say I have a drinking problem. I like to have fun. I like traveling. Part of protesting is traveling and meeting new people. And like I said, you know, partying. Now, your handle on Telegram was Captain Trump. Is that what it was? He says, yeah. Yeah, I adopted that handle in 2018. Any reason why? He says, well, nothing, anything special. Just, you know, I like Trump. Why? Oh, that's it. That's, that's, that's in big trouble. Those jurors are not going to like that. Probably looking at the death penalty right now. They're all scribbling in their notes. Execution. Gas chamber. Great. Uh, you like Trump? Why? Well, I liked Trump at the time because he was about lowering taxes. And he was a business guy. I thought our country was run like a business. So what better guy to run our country than a businessman? You know, I'd known Trump since he was young. Trump was a guy to kind of look up to. I didn't watch The Apprentice, but he had casinos and stuff like that. Hernandez says, but some of those casinos went bankrupt, didn't they? And he said, well, I'm not sticking up for him. You know, I mean, plenty of people go bankrupt all the time. It's not a big deal. Now, if you want me to say I lean one way or another, he says, conservative guys out there may torch me for this. But I lean independent, Real says. Nobody's going to, it's okay, Zach, that's okay. Did Proud Boy membership help his business? No, Real says. The reputation assigned to the Proud Boys probably set him back 10 years. Ugh. Yes. Now, Hern Hernandez asks him about the Proud Boys at the American Legion Banquet Hall. He says, what did you guys do with your money? Use it to buy beer and pizza? He says, yeah, basically. And the Proud Boys help each other out. You know, they kind of look out for each other. He says, yeah, any aspect possible, we would look out for each other. He said, doxing aside, one of the things we like to do with the Proud Boys is to make better men. He talks about the time when he met Demetrius Robbins, who testified more recently. He said, were you present when he and his family were being harassed by counter demonstrators? Zach says, no, I wasn't, but I was told about it after the fact. Says somebody introduced me to him. And, and then he paid for his hotel room out of his own pocket. So when Demetrius Robbins was in a bad position in a bad way, real helped him out. Now they were fearing for their lives, he said. They had a lot of little kids there. Police told them that they couldn't protect them on the walk back to their care. It was about a mile away. They were getting scared, so we just got them a hotel. They had a family, and I said, look, I'll put you in a hotel. Tomorrow should be calmed down, and that's exactly what I did. They were appreciative of that, and then they went home. Now, was that when Robbins and his cousin became a Proud Boy? Well, technically, he was given the first degree by Tario, but in the Proud Boys, you're not considered an actual member until your second degree. And then Robbins... They're talking about a block party. Now, they talk about another July night. Hernandez asks Zach, did anybody punch anybody on that night in July? No. Did you assault a police officer? No way. Did you destroy any property in July? No. Well, I want to ask you about November and December. How about these rallies? Was it mandatory to go to the rallies? Zach says no. It was voluntary. And you went to one of these in December, didn't you? Yeah. And Jeremy Bertino was there? Yeah. And was he acting aggressive? He says, yeah. He was at a rally there on December 11th and 12th. He says, I was there. I only helped coordinate things a little bit. Some of the activities during the day, but that's it. Was there a protest at night on the 11th? No. He says, there wasn't. We walked somewhere. There were some other protests. There was a 12-12 stop the thing, a rally. There was a protest. And Carmen asks him, Zach, were you there when Bertino was stabbed? No, I'm pretty sure I was back in my hotel room. Did you see a video of a flag burning or something like that? He says, no, I was definitely in my hotel by then. He says, yeah, there was a bonfire out there on that day. I did not see Bertino get stabbed. We did use radios because sometimes they are useful. I was very vocal about how these radios save one of my guy's lives. Something goes wrong. You can use these radios. They might save your life. There's nothing nefarious about it. 
Now you were sending text messages when you brought up the beneficial use of the radios in the chat, right? Yeah, I think so. I believe when I told people about a gain, like I said, I helped coordinating a thing during the day. I was the one who came up with the radios. We had guys with radios. We had guys saying hold, they would put their fist up in the air. And they're still talking about the 12th. Now, Judge Kelly hops in here and says, after some brief back and forth, Hernandez tries to get to the question she wants to ask. She stops and restarts. Says the evening events, the violence that night in December, we saw Bertino loud with his Mad Max thing on and Judge Kelly jumps in here. He says, okay, that's enough. We're just getting started. He says, we reached a good breaking point for the afternoon. Ugh. Judge. Once the jurors are excused, they get up and leave. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're done for the day. Judge Kelly scolds Carmen Hernandez. Says, Miss Hernandez, you are repeatedly testifying as to the evidence in this case. I know the government didn't want to object in the middle of your testimony. Well, in the middle of Mr. Real's testimony. But to say, she said, well, I was trying to put a question mark at the end, Judge, so it asked the question. She says, there were numerous times where you were trying to testify in the case, and that's not appropriate, says the judge. Oh, we're just taking a break. We're not taking the break. Judge excuses the jury, scolds Miss Hernandez, and brings the jury back. Judge says before the jury comes back, he says, hey, by the way, you know, I've been watching the jury. I'm really happy with what I'm seeing. I'm loving this. The marshal sitting behind Real in the witness stand, his head is below Real's. Jury doesn't seem distracted by his presence. He's like, I'm, re I'm feeling really good about my decision. So the jury comes back. Zach Real takes a sip of water, looking down at his hands, waiting for testimony to resume. Now, Hernandez proceeds with the direct exam and says, before we wrap up with December 12th, were you following the election results in the summer? Well, I guess in the fall. He says, yeah, I mean, of course I was following them. Are you still living in Philadelphia? Yeah, I was until now. I'm in prison now. Thanks for asking. What if anything happened during uh, in PA during the election? Well, PA was one of the big swing states. Obviously, everybody was no you know, knows about that. It was one of the six states that was contested. What's the definition of a swing state? Well, sometimes the Democrats will win. Other times a Republican will win. And PA swings the election? Yeah, many times it does. He said, well, there was a lot of protest going on. Philadelphia was a hotbed, so to speak. He says, Trump was aiming to investigate. He says, I live in Philly. There was a convention center and that's what Trump was talking a lot about. And you were interested in what was going on after the election, right? And he says, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the legal process, every time there's an election, every time there's an election, objection. Don't know what that was. Every time there's an election, objection. Hmm, wonder what he was gonna say. Now he continues. They bring up Doug Mastriano. They say, who is this guy? Well, he was one of the main people involved in an election suit in Pennsylvania. And you remember Rudy Giuliani holding press conferences at the Four Seasons and stuff? He says, yeah, actually. It was pretty embarrassing when Giuliani showed up there at the presser and it wasn't the Four Seasons. He says, it was a lot of, he says, very entertaining, no doubt. Were you on social media a lot back then in 2020? He says, yeah. I shared a lot of things about it. Very hot topic. Trump made it very popular. It was all over the newsfeed. Did you post articles? I'm sure I did. Yeah, I posted a lot of stuff. And he says, but what about, what about when it was already certified? And he says, they all do it. 
all of them dispute election results, launching objections. Prosecutors are objecting like nuts. But he's right about it. Hillary Clinton did it when she lost. Trump was hoping states wouldn't certify, he said. Were you following his posts? Yeah, Trump was on Twitter. He posted all the time. He shared things from senators. Mastriano was one of them. I don't know whether any of it was true. And so what did you think about what Mastriano was doing from Pennsylvania? He says, actually, I think Mastriano is a little too conservative for my liking, actually. A little too much for me. Husher comes off. And now they're talking about the chat. Now, Mr. Real, was there a decision by you and the other Proud Boys to create your own self-defense chat? He says, yeah. What was the purpose of that? Well, we wanted to prevent violence. We wanted to protect members from getting injured. And was that a result of what happened on December 12th or not? And he says, well, it was one of the reasons. After the election, we got a huge influx of new guys and we needed to get more organized. One of the ways we didn't want guys coming in thinking they saw fighting on YouTube, that, that we were a bunch of fighters. He says, that's not what we were about at all. Have you ever personally attacked Zach or punched a police officer at any rally? No, never. When I did events in Philly, I actually worked with law enforcement. I worked with the terrorist task force. Now you gave us two reasons why you might have a chat. One was to protect members and one was to avoid violence. Is that true? Yeah, to minimize violence as much as possible. And you said that there was a, an influx of new members, right? Yeah. We just got done having our name dropped on the biggest platform in the world, he says. There were a lot of people who wanted to join, but didn't know the first thing about the Proud Boys. So they had their own mindset about what it was. And so we had to vet some of those guys. And that was if we wanted to recruit them at all. I mean, there were a lot of people we were who were all about protesting and we're not only about protesting. You know, it's a fraternity. This isn't just a party. It's a fraternity. We engage in networking, entrepreneurship and drinking. He says lots of it. Tario invited real to MOSD, he says. Yeah, he's the big one. He invited me in. He says, who was the top enchilada of the whole thing? Well, you had the marketing team, you had operations. Tario was part of marketing. Nordine, I think, was another one. Biggs was operation. And Blackbeard, John Stewart, was a part of something else. Who was the third person in ops? He says, I can't really recall that. He says... I don't even know we were doing that. Are any of the Philly Proud Boys with you? Isaiah Giddings. They joined on a call. There was a meeting one night. They hop on this call together. It looks like it's a Zoom video conference. And Aaron of the Bloody East, or this guy called Aaron Wolkind, was a vice president of the Philly Proud Boys chapter. Anything about his talents that led him to becoming the vice president? Well, I see uh, Zach says, I tried to run it like a business with a structure. So I didn't just put guys in positions because they were my friends. Aaron loved recruiting, very good at vetting guys, very passionate about it. So he moved up quickly. A lot of guys trusted him and I made him VP for that reason. Was Aaron a member in a number of chats making provocative statements? Yeah, from what I can recall, says, yeah, I guess you could say that. Yeah, he was in a bunch of those chats. Aaron was good at vetting. He put him in with the Proud Boys, but didn't admit him to the chat. Now they're asking questions. Can you explain whether when he said something, you did not reject it or agree to it. What does it mean? Remember that the government was saying that if somebody said something bad in the chat and you didn't affirmatively reject it or say something about it or leave the chat, that you were agreeing with it, you know, that you were tacitly approving it. So they ask them this, you know, if you're in a group chat and somebody says something bad and you're not like, ah, apparently you're just as guilty. You agree to that according to the federal government. 
So they said, what does that mean when you didn't say anything? You didn't reject it. You didn't agree to it. It just flew by on the chat, you know, like happens every single time you're in a chat. It doesn't mean anything, you know? He's a grown ass man, he says. If he says something stupid, chances are there's gonna be four or five other guys who say it's something stupid, none of my business. For me to go into every single chat and go in and correct him and a bunch of other people, that's not that's what we call beating a dead horse. It's not my job to police a chat room. I don't go into every chat room and tell every guy, hey, you said something stupid. Just because I don't correct him doesn't mean I don't agree with everything he says. I'm my own person for one. There are a lot of these chats. Are all the members of the Proud Boys, you know, grown something men? There are no kids in the Proud Boys? No, you got to be over 21. We go to bars. What did you mean by grown ass man? She says. Well, it's some it's someone who takes responsibility for their actions. If a man goes into a chat and says something stupid, that's on him. And anyways, if they're saying dumb things, it's probably just bluster anyways. They go back to the chat. Did you bring any members into the chat? Yeah, I brought a couple people in. Wanted to keep it small at first. You mentioned other people were in the chat. Jim Kelly, was he there with you in D.C.? saying other people were brought into the chat. They shared a hotel room together. Talks about Finley from the West Virginia chapter. Now, here we go back. I want to get to some J6 stuff. When you were there, did any of these gentlemen, Giddings, Vi, Helian, did any of them assault officers on J6? Did Giddings attack officers? No. Helian? No. Giddings? Not that I saw. No. Finley? No. Real? Did you destroy property? No. Did Finley? No. Did Real? Did you attack any police officers on J6? No. Did you see any officers attacked? Did you see any police officers attacked on 1-6? He shakes his head. No, I did not. Was there a plan for 1-6? He says, it wasn't fully established at the time, but it was expected we would march around the city like we always do. And then afterwards, go hang out and drink. Same thing we do every rally and every protest. So Zach, there was no specific plan for anybody at all to meet men from Philly? Were there any objectives in the chat? No, the only thing expected was a march. Now, you weren't told about any plans on January 5th, were you? Correct. And you were in the leadership organization, weren't you? Yeah, MOSD, yeah. Were you or were you not told of any plans for J6? No. Now, they're talking about an audio file. And looks like we got to pick up. Thank you for that connection here. Your, they say your understanding at that point was that Tario was going to do a speech. They're walking through some conversations. Between the fifth and the sixth, Zach, did you receive any information from anybody, from any defendants about a plan for the six? No, none. Other than to show up at the monument? Yeah, that's correct. On March that day, did anybody tell you of a plan? No, nothing. Other than walking around and taking pictures. Did Mr. Nordeen tell you about a plan to attack the Capitol? No, absolutely not. Did Biggs or Tario tell you to attack the Capitol? No. Did Mr. Donahoe who already pled guilty to conspiracy tell you to attack the Capitol? No. Did Nordine tell you to destroy property? No. Did Biggs Tario tell you to destroy property? No. One by one, Carmen asks, did, real, did you tell Giddings to assault or attack the police? No. To impede the police? No. To destroy any property? No. On and on we go. Says the government has played a bunch of videos of people spraying stuff around. Have you seen those videos? Yeah. Did you tell Pozzola to take a shield and break a window? No, I did not. I didn't even know Pozzola before 1 6. Were you present when that was happening? No, I wasn't. I was completely on the other end of the Capitol area. 
Did you instruct Pozzola to destroy any property, impede any laws, break anything? No, I didn't even know who he was. But you were on a march with Mr. Biggs for the most of the day, weren't you? Yeah. And you separated at some point? Yeah, 118, we were separated. I never saw him again. I didn't see him until trial. Now, did you go inside the Capitol? Carmen asks. I did. I went inside the Capitol after it was understood that Mike Pence had evacuated the building and all the members were also evacuated. That's what I was told by a friend of mine in a text message. Members of Congress were safe. My understanding was that there was nobody in there except for the police. And that's when you enter? That's when I entered. What difference did that make to you? He says, well, there was a proceeding going on inside. I didn't want to affect anything going on in there. I wanted the legal process to play out. He says, this is the process our country was founded on. That's what was playing out on January 6th. And I had no intentions of going into that building if members of Congress were in there. And I didn't go in until I knew they were out. Did you see any police at the door when you went into the building? No. There were no police officers barring entry to the door that I came through. Well, what did you see at that time? They seemed welcoming to people coming in at that time. There were hundreds of people. It was like going into a baseball game. Hundreds of people going into one area. There were too many to count. Now, when you were inside there, Zach, did you attack any police? No. No, I didn't. And we end it here. The judge says we've got a hard stop at five o'clock. Sidebar, jury leaves, but only for a moment. Says a jo uh, avoid all media coverage. And that is it for the day. Starting at 9.30 tomorrow, motion and lemonades coming in hot. 403, but we're going to get a bunch new uh, of additional filings. Kelly says Metcalf will file his motion tonight. 9.30 a.m. tomorrow. Another great trial thread, courtesy of our friend Brandy Buckman on Twitter. And so Zachary Real testified today. He's not done yet. They'll be back tomorrow. We'll surely have a bunch of cross-examination from the prosecutor as well. And so, of course, we will come back. Thank you for subscribing and liking and following along. There'll be a lot more on this and we'll have new filings to dig into as well. But we covered some good stuff today. Proud Boys trial, day 53. Zachary Real, the only defendant to have testified so far, is still on the stand. We'll pick back up with him. We know that the defense is also filing for a mistrial and a motion to dismiss based on the Court of Appeals ruling, saying that the obstruction charge needs to go away. And another explosive filing from Roger Roots on behalf of defendant Dominic Pozzola, Proud Boy, saying, over 50 informants, over 50 informants in this matter. Only this matter. Only these defendants. Extrapolate that out. Times all of the other agencies, all of the other defendants across the whole country. Amazing. And so that, my friends, is it for us on the day. Now, we are going to go over for our debrief over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com and our YouTube members. Don't forget to grab that Telegram link in the community post section so you can join us on Telegram because the after party is going to be there as well. Also, don't forget to get your, your super food, your real organic greens at fieldofgreens.com. But now, my friends, let's see... What you have to say about this, let's check in with our friends on YouTube, on Twitter, on Rumble, on Locals, and see who is here, because we have to see what you have to say about all this. And we had a couple that I saw come through, just one actually, from our friend Fred. What's up, Fred and Johnny? We got one. <sighs> Says, Rob, I finally asked Johnny, how many CHSs and undercover informants were embedded on J6. He barked and said, there were over 2,500 in the crowd. <laughs> I was going to try to do a bark. 
I'm not going to try it. They're over 25. How can you even bark a whole sentence like that? Anyways, 20, I believe him, Fred. And Johnny is probably the one who's orchestrating it. We do know he's deeply embedded with all of the various intelligence agencies. Ugh. Has he been served with a subpoena yet? Everybody's focused on Ray Epps. Somebody's got to subpoena Johnny. Get his butt into the trial. Thank you, Fred, for the super chat. Very much appreciate that. And we had some friends over on Locals, over on Rumble, over on Twitter. I see Matt's mom is over on Rumble. Good to see Matt's mom in the house. We, <laughs> we've got some interesting comments. Uh, very interesting comments over there today. Good stuff. We have Eric Scorpios over there. Janek, Chappaquiddick drinker. Thanks, Rob. A heavy one. Be safe and everyone have a good one. Yeah, it's a tough, tough, tough. Tough day today. Thanks, Robert. Hard to listen to this total injustice. Good to see you, Seth. And member of the public, troubles in the house. Misogynist is over there. Good to see a little galaxy next it over there. Thanks, V. Vienti Kiss. RD Hayward over on Rumble. We appreciate all of our Rumble friends. We love uh, we love you subscribing on Rumble too. Rumble's great. Rumble's an awesome place. Their app's coming together. It's a beautiful app, and you're getting. Uh, I think the shorts are gonna start working on the Rumble app too. So all very, very cool stuff. Let's say hello to Twitter and see what's happening over on Twitter. Is anybody watching over on Twitter? Oh my gosh, the whole system is broken. What, what happened here? How do we have 284 viewers? The system is broken. This is impossible. We've never even, we've hardly broken 10 before. This is out of control. The whole system's crashing. Elon, is Elon, did Elon retweet us or something? How did this happen? <laughs> this is amazing. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our Twitter friends. We never have 284 followers. Most of us, most people will follow us along on YouTube or on Rumble and stay connected. But we're, we're very excited. We come back to Twitter every day, even if it's just me and somebody else. We don't care because we're supporting Elon. We're supporting the free speech platforms. We want to support the entities and the institutions that are gonna allow us to continue to have actual real conversations. And so we're gonna to continue to come back here and support Twitter. Thanks for following us and thanks for joining us here. What a fun surprise, what happened? I don't know how that happened. But while we're here, let's say hello to some of the comments in the Twitter thread. And here's, here's one of them from Danny McWilliams. This is a Nicolas Cage comment. Put the bunny back in the box. Put the bunny back in the box from Danny McWilliams over on Twitter. Let's see who else is in the house. Uh, King A e King EG is here. Oh, I know what it is. We got a boost from Julie Kelly. We got a boost from Julie Kelly. Shout out to Julie Kelly, huh? We got a boost. Somebody gave us a big boost over there. And so we're very grateful for the Twitter boost. Thank you. Probably a Julie Kelly boost. Thank you to Julie Kelly. And Julie Kelly does. The, some of the best work on this, uh, if not the best work on it. She has been on the January 6th stuff from the very beginning, an amazing follow. And if you're not already following her, make sure you're doing that. And thank you that for that King AG. And thanks for the boost. We had another one from Paula says in so uh, entrapment. Yeah, it would be, it would be like a counter. Um, it's almost like another conspiracy. It's like they're in a subset of a conspiracy. It's, it's a conspiracy within a conspiracy. And they can't talk about it at all. Not ideal. Jack Flack is over here, says cannot process this. Jay Adams says, Rob, HSI are special agents, same as the FBI, same authority. Well, yeah, I mean, the problem is that that they don't feel like they can, they have to tell you about it, tell you about them. They just say that they're part of an irrelevant agency. You only need to know about the FBI. Okay, well, what about all of the other feds that implicate our clients? or that might exonerate our clients if we got our hands on the exculpatory material. Where is all of that? They say that it's not uh, pertinent, apparently. And so, holy moly, so that was a ton of fun over on Twitter. Thank you everybody for following us along on Twitter. We do this live every day if you're just joining us. So every day at about this time, we're just wrapping up on the show, but every day it is at 6 p.m. Eastern time, we go live and we'd love to see you back here. So come in and join us and if, if you know, Twitter is not where you regularly watch video. Be sure the Rumble link is in the Twitter profile. Follow us along over there or come and find us on YouTube. Either way, we'll look forward to seeing you there as well. But we are done for the day. We had some very nice tips come on over on Locals. Don't be hating. Said demotions 
to dismiss ever work, especially during long trials? Not, no, almost never. All right. Especially a motion like this. The judge is not going to come back and say, it's a pretty good argument there, defense counsel. Case dismissed unless it was something monumental. But if it was something monumental, it would it would be all over the news. It would, you know, and if it's something monumental, it's probably more likely that the prosecutors would dismiss it, you know, voluntarily. Like it would be so egregious. Otherwise, no, especially not at this stage. But you still have to make those motions to preserve them because they're technical. And if you don't make them, you may lose the argument to make those arguments on appeal. There's going to be gobs of appeals on this case. I hope. We'll see. But thank you for the tip. John says, Rob, I tried the mind map. It's confusing. When are you releasing the tutorial? I guess it is a little confusing. It is a little confusing over there. I, I do know that. But the mind map is, well, it's not that. Oh, I'll have to do a tutorial. You're right. Good to see you, John. And don't be hating says locals chat is not working suddenly again. No, don't. Well, it looks like it's working over here for me. I'm not sure. Oh, I'll have to, we'll check it out. We're going over to the locals after party here in a short minute. But that, my friends, is it for us on the day. And so if you wanted to check the mind map out, you could. You could go to spotlightlawyer.com slash mind map or go to spotlightlawyer.com slash Trump. And you can actually access the Trump prosecution witch hunt mind map if you want to check that out. Of course, don't forget to use code Robert over at Field of Greens. The vegetables really do want to be eaten. It is good for you to be healthy and energize and just bursting with green energy everywhere you go. Check them out, fieldofgreens.com, 15% with code Robert. We are going over to watching the watchers.locals.com. YouTube members, we're grateful for you joining us. And thank you to Dolphin Fan. Dolphin Fan, I saw you donoed more members and our member only morning streams are getting a lot more full, a lot of chat activity. And so we're grateful to see everybody uh, see you joining in here. Yes, and Adam M is saying, did you see the membership gifts? Where? I did see them from Dolphin Fan in the house. Very grateful for that. And if I miss, if somebody else gave, I'll, I'm a, I'll look it up and I'll correct the record tomorrow if I miss anybody. But I appreciate it. We're very grateful for all of our members who are joining us. If you are a, a new YouTube member, grab the Telegram link because even though we're going to be done here, we are not done for the day and we want to see you over there. We also want to thank the mods who mod down the fort for us and keep this show nice and orderly. Big shout outs to our friends, Vienticus Prime, K Bean. We got Just Cause, Playing Hooky, Ronnie Cole, our friend Zulu, Geomancy. We got Zach Nichols, John Allen, our meme Smiths, Sleepy Dogly, and Jigum Gigum. We're grateful for everybody who helps keep this show together nice and orderly, keeping the train on the tracks. But we are done here for the day. We are going to go over for our member only segment. We hope to see you there. But if not, we will be back here tomorrow at the same time to do it all again. And we hope to see you here. It will be Proud Boys Trial Day 54. We'll see what the judge has in store. And there will be a lot more to attend to. We'll look forward to going through it together. Until then, my friends, make it a beautiful night. I'll see you right back here tomorrow so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Have a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.